Welcome back to Hello County. We're here at uh, Michael's Restaurant, 8417 West Cleveland Avenue. Actually, Michael's Family Restaurant, right? That's what they go by. A uh, very nice place. And we're here with Devin Graciali to continuing to talk about the Historical Society. And Devin brought some toys. Are these toys for us? Or you're trying to stump me? Or trying to stump this, the... Uh, which would be pretty easy. Yeah, so. it, yeah it was... <laughs> I was actually stumped on a few of them and had to do research on them. But um, like I said earlier we do get lots of uh, donations of artifacts and that mostly coming from second third generation uh, family members that don't know what some of the items are or, and can't put them into the dumpster themselves uh, but they think maybe the historical society could use them so um, I also go around to different um, clubs and organizations and I bring along what I call a tabletop museum with me. Mm -hmm. And um, when I go to nursing homes, uh, senior homes, um, uh, different uh, organizations, I bring this uh, some of these artifacts with me. So, Chuck, I brought a couple yeah. that I just thought I'd uh, that one up and I'd mention to you. See who can. Uh, uh, and I thought maybe you would see what that is. Yeah, if you'd Let's like see. to kind of take a guess. I don't want to break anything. Does it pull apart or no? Okay. It can, but you then you lost your marbles. Kevin's our uh, guesser, right? Are you? Uh, so, are so, so this isn't the, your guess. This isn't I, my guess. I couldn't think of a better word. But uh, so I made little cutouts of these to to show them on the screen. I labeled this picture um, cherry picker. Cherry picker. But I believe what it does is back in the 1920s. The, the women of the house would buy that and they would use it to massage their cheeks and it would get get rid of wrinkles. Well, you're pretty close. Is you're, pretty, you're pretty close because it does have something to do with cheeks, but not women's cheeks. Uh-oh, now that opened up a whole new door for yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> so actually, and I when I first uh, got it, and it, when it came into the museum, I thought it would go in the kitchen, hang on the wall, and you'd put your towel in between ah, yeah. there, and, you know, it does pull apart. towel yeah. holder. Yeah, it yeah. pulls apart a little bit. Okay. Later to find out, no, and I don't know if you can see years. that, uh, but it's uh, it's actually a hoax item. It was used uh, and sold as a razor blade sharpener. So they were thinking that you could run your razor blade through really? those glass marbles really? and it would sharpen the razor blade. Obviously it was a hoax, <laughs> but uh, I never, I would have put it in the kitchen somewhere and it actually uh, is a, a hoax item. So, uh, and it's interesting, um, the museums in Wisconsin have a listserv run by the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. And any time an article comes in that we just don't know what it is, we take a digital photo of it, throw it up on this listserv, and by and large, other museum directors throughout the state will kind of say, oh, I know what that is. That's, uh, you know, a thingamajig type thing, you know. And uh, we'd get our answers that way. So it was thrown up on the listserv? And it was, and, and I ended up back. doing some research on it from the web and found out that it was a hoax item. Razor blade sharpener. So are we going to keep this and then start selling these on here? Is that what we're going to Well, yeah, do? I've got an idea oh. for my next business. Uh, well, I think I'm, we need to put yeah. it to the test. You need to grow a beard. A beard, check. yeah. And well, then you, you weekly, you got to. <laughs> we'll give you a dull razor. razor. We'll give you a dull razor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to try anything. Let's try it, whatever. No, that's very nice. That's Here's a, another item, Chuck. I thought I'd let okay, you look at it. What is this? It's this is labeled in my pictures clear thing. clear thing. Clear thing. It is an actual crystal, glass crystal with nice etchings on it. Any idea what now that might got, be? It's Does the top come too. off of that? Yeah. And there's no hole on it because I was looking like a salt shaker. That's what I was thinking. I was right thinking right. wine or salt, but I, I think Catch-22, I think it's going to be something like uh, laundry detergent or soap. It's, yeah, it has leaves or... It's like pine things under, isn't it? Leaves and stuff. And then inside there, there's a smaller, you know, you got the outside, mm -hmm. and then there's a glass thing inside too. So let me see if it's, oh, it's maybe open it, on the bottom. Oh. So it is open on the bottom. So you can put something in there. Was there a, I'm assuming there was a plug on here. I don't know. We don't know, yeah. 
because if you would put that could be even like a decorative thing where you put different color water in there or something and if it's got the plug and then you put it down you could change it I don't know. My first instinct was it's a salt shaker because that's what it looked like. But, well, you're pretty uh, good with putting water in there. That's really? a good. Okay. That's a good hint. Is it you're something for close. plants? Just and you're pretty good stick, saying it's something for plants. Stick, stick that the in the ground and it keeps the plant growing straight. Yeah. It's it's pretty decorative to be out in the lawn though. Yeah. Limousine bud vase. Or so, Boz, do we say Boz? Well, if you say limousine, you must say Boz. <laughs> <laughs> so not in West Allis, which is a meat and potato uh, community, but maybe in Wauwatosa or Nancy North Shore. Those affluent, affluent. Uh, yes. Those. If you happen to own a limousine, this would uh, sit in the back seat and they put a fresh carnation ah. or, you know. Yeah, maybe you can see the picture. I don't know if you can see the can picture. Can you see the picture on there? I don't know if you can see it. In, limousine, in limousine limousine bud vase that actually makes sense though. yeah i had no clue i found it in the attic of the museum and oh really i had to go find out what it find was what is that so wh where do you when you just find a random item how do you go about researching what is this because you well, can't just google what most of our what is this thing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> most of our articles have an actual accession number, so I can look up in old books, account books, where they hand wrote when it came into the museum and what it was, who donated it, that type of thing. Other things um, don't have an accession number, or it says to be accessioned, and then I again I would go online and I take a digital picture of it, put it up on listserv, try to find out if any other museum directors in that have occasion to come across it and find out what it is and there's usually somebody out there that has there's usually somebody something, something yeah, yeah. Uh, or even uh, one of the items that i knew nothing about when i would take it to the women's club and stuff like that every woman knew it exactly <laughs> what it was and i had no clue it was something used you know and they use it even to this day it was a glass another glass like this mm -hmm. but it was a rolling pin that you would put ah. ice or cold water in when you were doing doughs that needed to be cooled or something it would help like that. with uh straightening it out or yeah. i have no clue okay well interesting i like that here's my last item here um, okay something that comes in and again it's it's a uh, implement and i didn't know does it go in the hardware department does it go you know it had a couple numbers on it so that's the first thing i do is search on google throw the numbers in there and that and okay. uh it's in good shape this stuff is in good shape right? yeah so but that's I had, open like that, right? Yeah. So you can it seems like make a something. Scary with medical it. device. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> Have you been to the urologist of it lately? Yeah. Is that I don't what you're wanna, talking I don't about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is kind of scary when you think. Has a hole on one end. <laughs> That's a, uh, you know, Pabst and Miller came rolling into town. Everyone was drinking a lot. They needed the cure for the hangover, and that that there is a pickle squeezer to get all the juice out of the the pickles. That wouldn't be in West. There's no bars in West Dallas. So oh right. my goodness. <laughs> so what was interesting with this one is again took a picture of it, put it up on the web. Yeah. Found out that it doesn't go in your garage tool box. It does go in your kitchen, kitchen drawer. Thing, yeah. This is a vintage mold for making mock chicken legs. Mock chicken legs. Do you remember those? I do. I remember I, no. school lunch programs I had it in the this. 50s and 60s. Oh, really? You get mock chicken legs. What, what, which what were they made was, out of? It was hamburger or pork uh, sausage. Really? And, uh, you know, they would put those on there. It looked a little bit like a chicken leg if you uh, <laughs> like come out of the That's mold. That's kind of like fraud to me. I don't know. <laughs> it's a chicken without poultry. And there was no, uh, they didn't put anything to... To replicate the bone, it was just kind of the actually shape. this hole. That's it's a is. wooden stick. They put okay. a wooden stick in between, <laughs> and then they put it in the oven and fry it up, and you really? have mock and chicken legs. The yeah. Real chicken legs, yeah. or not real? It's mock, mock. I feel like this That's is something. Uh, we have another on-air host, Deb, who's a vegetarian. And so she might appreciate something like that. Yeah, sure. For sure. <laughs> Maybe she'll come in and what? Some of these, yeah. Make her mock. Our viewers might not have known. You that, could make vegetable based <laughs> mock chicken legs. Yeah, some oh, kind of yeah. weird like vegetable uh, gluten monstrosity yeah. that you squeeze in there. I would never ever think of that. No. 
So these, these are kind of cute, and I take these around. Uh, I've got a whole uh, cadre of them that I, I bring around. I use two old beer cases to uh, schlep these things around from either a school presentation or, like I said, a club presentation, something like that. Also, those are, um, I never charge. I always ask for a donation if uh, right. somebody wants to donate. There's never a charge to come to the museum. Um, but um, I find that leaving little uh, donation baskets all over, I actually make more money mm -hmm. on donations than if I would say, oh, it costs a dollar and a quarter to get in or right. you know something like that. So it's the same thing when I go out and give um, a tour, a speaking tour, or right now I have um, three YouTube videos up on YouTube about uh, West Allis and mm -hmm. uh, one's on the women of West Allis, the wonderful women of West Allis. In fact, I have a picture of our first um, police matron. Oh, really? Uh, okay. She retired before you started, ah. but then our very first uh, female police officer, mm -hmm. her What's picture's up? on there. What's a police matron? Well, it's interesting. Um, back in the, when the police department started, they did need someone in case you had to make an arrest of a female or search a, fe yeah. a female, you had to call someone in. And what they were doing uh, in the very beginning is they were calling in someone from the secretarial pool. And Chuck knows about our uh, records department, you know, and, and come and have a, a female there to assist. This lady, Arlene Zevnik, started in the secretarial pool and then actually became um, a matron. And then, if you remember the TV show Angie Dickinson, mm -hmm. Police Woman? Mm -hmm. Those, that was a special category where you didn't have to do everything that a police officer did, and you just worked in the detective bureau or in the youth guidance bureau, came in, uh, uh, in skirt and that. She did carry a gun, uh, Arlene oh, Zevnik, okay. yeah, carried a gun. Uh, had a mouth like a uh, like a drunken sailor. So a perfect uh, fit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and she, um, uh, yeah, she was uh, paired up with uh, somebody in YGB. I remember, she was only on a few years when I started. I mean, uh, I was only on a few years uh, before she retired. Okay. But then uh, we did get um, our very first police officer and our first female firefighter. So this particular uh, YouTube video I have, the wonderful women of West Dallas, celebrates that fairer sex going all the way back from the beginning all the way up to now uh, including politics and so when was you know. the so the the police matron had retired uh, a few years after you started and when was that like the 70s 70s yeah, yeah. and then they Andy Dickinson <laughs> and then they had he has no idea uh, I don't I've never heard of that <laughs> and then they had the I first the uh, women uh, woman police officer when yeah, she was hired, I think, our, uh, in 77. It was Colleen, right? Yeah, Colleen okay. Baker. Yeah. Um, and she was hired and had to go through the exact regimen that, um, yeah. you know, the regular police officer had to go through. And and um, we have quite a few women on the department oh, now. Yeah. Uh, cool. I, I don't know the exact amount, but... Yeah, I'm back but then, the same thing yeah. with the fire department, yeah. you know. It took a while for them to break in, but once they broke in, it's... I'm sure that's happening throughout all the different um, oh, yeah. careers, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But I do celebrate uh, even people that notoriously won blue ribbons at the fair, you know, regular citizens. Uh, there's a couple of sports figures from West Allis that uh, made it big. Um, you Dan? Know, so, what's that? Dan? Well, Dan is one, <laughs> but I'm talking women. Oh, okay. Yeah, women. we've got some, uh, we have the first person uh, entered into both the um, LPGA Hall of Fame and the Wisconsin um, Women's Professional Golf Hall of Fame and grew up, went to school here in West Dallas, actually had, um, uh, besides being a pro at one of our local golf uh, clubs here in West Dallas, she actually had a, a little golf shop where you could, um, uh, she taught golf and then you could, like a driving range indoor driving range off 77th and Greenfield. Oh, so, right. yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So she, and um, along with, um, I celebrate a woman that won 101 medals speed skating. Mm. But it was before the Olympics recognized speed skating ah. as a uh, women's speed skating as okay. a sport. Uh, they first recognized women speed skaters in 1960 okay. in Lake Placid, New York, 
Well, this lady won all her medals in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Wow. 101 medals all throughout the Midwest, and that um, was on a, a West Dallas skate club, which really? uh, was one of the premier skate clubs in the entire country. Mm. Um, that was, uh, Ben Jensen was part of that too, yeah. uh, part of that skate club. And it was because of that skate club and the fair park that we have this big building in the middle of downtown West Dallas that looks like an, it now is a senior apartment place, right. but it was called the West Dallas Inn. It was like a big hotel with a hundred rooms, but it was to, um, you know, to house both the entertainers at the fair uh, remember, you could go to the fair in the old days and get a grandstand ticket, yeah. and your your entrance to the fair gave you the grandstand show ticket too. And well, we had people like no, <laughs> we had Bob Hope and Lauren Green, oh, really? uh, nice. the boys from Bonanza. They all stayed at the West Dallas Inn. Oh really? Yeah, I've that. got pictures at the museum, you know, of them staying there. Is West Dallas still known for skating? Does it have? I don't know. They have Does the, that club still exist? I don't know if that club is still I'm not sure if the club exists because I have I had turned over to me all the records of the club, so I'm not sure that it still exists. But it was the impetus of that club and the skating, and I think more of the manufacturing. Um, it was people uh, or businesses like Alice Chalmers and Kearney and Trekker, Prestdale Tank, they had actual leagues for basketball, for bowling, for ice skating. Mm -hmm. They actually donated money to the city to help putting ice rinks at every school and oh. every field house. Um, they're responsible and actually paid for the Franklin Field House and the McKinley Field House, which are okay. still standing today. Okay. They actually uh, donated the money for that. But because of this interest in their employees and their employees' families, that put West Dallas on the map for this speed skating club, which then brought to West Dallas and the Milwaukee area the very first uh, oval for um, Olympic size oval for uh, speed skating in the 1960s. That's why that hotel okay. was built there. We had the only one in the country, the only Olympic size oval. And where was that? Was that it was. It's right where the Pettit Center is now. Oh, it was there. Okay. So um, the original one was real close by, and it was the uh, Olympic oval. And people from all over the world came to practice and do time, time trials and that there. Okay. And then eventually they built the Pettit Center, mm -hmm. which is a premier um, Olympic uh, training space for right. um, skaters here in our country. So uh, it's kind of a feather in the hat of West Dallas, I kind of say, you mm -hmm. know, that this all kind of happened and, and, and uh, matured that way. So. Yeah, I never knew speed skating was that prevalent in that and went back that far. Yeah. Because yeah. I only really saw it when Dan Jansen was doing sure. it and that highlighted it for everybody. Right. And then you have Bonnie Blair and all those other uh, people that were well known for it as well. So. And there were, like, before that, there was a guy called Lem Bombard. Okay. Uh, and they were all from Wisconsin, and okay. so yeah, it was very interesting. So there's a big history with speed skating, even in the West Dallas area. It Correct. Like. So that's, that's yeah, I didn't know that. They had actual international and uh, nationals on the um, before they had these ovals. Um, the McCarty Park Lagoon hosted, okay. and I've got brochures from s club where the international uh, race was held on the lagoon. Okay, which is right out here, M McCarty Park Lagoon, <laughs> yeah. just. Uh, stones throw away. Walk over there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's a very interesting. I, I find that very interesting with the speed skating and and all that. And then the nursing home. That's on 74th and is it 74th or 74th and Greenfield down there. Right. There's a mural on it now. They painted a big mural on it. Right. Yeah. So that's a historic building in itself. Then. It is historic to the point where you don't see a, a, a gigantic hotel like that in right. the middle of a, a little downtown strip. But it did uh, actually advertise in Finland and Norway to come and stay at that hotel so you could practice your speed skating at the, oh, at really? the Oval. So uh, I have a program out on the back um, wow. where they're uh, actually in a foreign language asking people to... So it was international, they have people from all over the world coming. Correct. Doing that. Great. Who'd have, who'd have thought that, right? Uh, let's, uh, I just wanted to get back a little bit so I don't forget to Alice Chalmers. Uh, Alice Chalmers was down on 70, is it off the 70th Street, or is that the actual location where it was? Yeah, the footprint goes from around what we call Holly Road or 60th Street all right. the way to 70th Street, from Greenfield Avenue all the way to the uh, old Milwaukee um, 
uh, road uh, railroad tracks. And so um, it's actually would have been in the township of Wauwatosa, but it, um, it, it actually is West Allis for the most part. It was a 100-acre site. It was an old farm, and it became one of the best manufacturing places in not only um, the state, but um, the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, many buildings on it, many of its um, products are still in operation today. So they specialized in the, several areas. One was um, hydroelectric turbines. And these turbines would drive um, uh, the electricity. And they were actually, um, right now, the Hoover Dam uh, has the same turbine running. It's almost 100 years now it's been running. And there's no wear on it at all. Mm-hmm. Also, the turbines at the Nile Aswan High Dam in on the Nile River mm-hmm. has Alice Chalmers turbines in it. Oh, really? Wow. Created the electricity. They did a lot of work with the TVA or their Tennessee Valley Authority with electric hydroelectric power. So uh, they specialized in that. Everyone knows them for their orange tractors mm-hmm. that you see around um, still. Right. They had a big tractor plant here in the West Allis area. But it was the turbines and some of their. Um, uh, later technologies, fuel cells and that they were working on. They actually were one of the contractors for the Manhattan Project. Uh, we know just recently that uh, Oppenheimer movie came out. And we found, um, I got a, an email a couple of years ago from um, the Energy Department in Washington, D.C., asking if this building was still uh, on the Alice Chalmers site. They built the building in 1943 and uh, the Holly Road plant specifically for production of some of the equipment that was going to be used in the Manhattan Project to create the atomic bomb. And pound for pound, more stuff came out of that plant and got shipped to Los Alamos than any other place in the country. There were different um, uh, areas in the country working on items for this um, atomic bomb, but they weren't in connection or communication with uh, within anything. No one plant knew exactly what they were making and for what purpose. And so they that way they could keep it a secret. And yeah. uh, it did turn out to be a good secret and it actually ended up um, you know, ending World War II uh, earlier than what would be expected and with a lot less loss of life. Um, over the years, Alice Chalmers, like I said, very heavy involvement in the community. But what had happened is when they did go under uh, bankrupt in uh, the 80s, 1987. Yeah, okay. 87. Um, it left a sour taste in the mouth of, of a lot of people in West Allis because most of uh, everybody living in West Allis either worked there or had a family member who worked right. there. And many of them that had retired out of there lost a lot of their pension because of the bankruptcy. bankruptcy. They got maybe a, a dime on a dollar in their pension, which... Um, left a sour taste in the mouth both there and it also let uh, the city fathers know that you really shouldn't depend on just one uh, company industry um, that you should diversify a little bit which is I think our current mayor is doing Mm -hmm. diversifying out to make sure that we don't have a big uh, collapse like that what um um, I feel like you said when we were we were talking yesterday it was the largest employer in the state. Is that That's Alice correct. Palmer? During World War II, it employed 46,000 people. And that was kind of when it was at its, its height in terms of, you know, size and, uh, yes. I don't know, impact. Okay. And they made a lot of the war materials. Most industries needed, did right? that. Um, yeah. Most of your companies, like Press Steel Tank, uh, they were making, like, um, beer barrels, you know, those, uh, those uh, half barrels and quarter barrels and stuff. And when war came, then they would make uh, tubes for um, uh, the submarines, uh, for the, um, I'm trying to remember what's the ordinance that comes out of the submarine, the uh, torpedoes. He'll know. He'll know. He torpedoes, yeah, that's right. They would make that um, uh, gear, they'd re gear their um, for war production. Right. So Alice Chalmers was making tractors, but then they ended up making some tanks and stuff you know, yeah. with the same type uh, uh, of equipment. Um, and um, I've got a shell that uh, they made for the World War One when they geared up for World War One on display. Uh, one of our other factories, uh, Federal Malleable, that was in West Allis at the time, I've got a grenade that they made from World War One 
on display at the live, museum. It? It's not it's live. It's not live. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Don't pull the pin, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, um, it, it was, so we're kind of coming out of that um, uh, era where I used to go and say, how many people know somebody that worked at Alice Chalmers? And right. over half of the people would raise a hand. Yeah. It's getting less and less now that they've been out of business been since 87. Yeah. Yeah. But they did, were a great contributor, not only locally, but also, um, you know, nationally. So I think they were a contributor to the corner bars in West Dallas, too. Oh, my gosh. Because we have like one or two, I think. We I do. Know. And, you know, <laughs> during the wars, I should have brought that sign with me. There's a picture of a little kid and he got his finger in front and it says, shh, war worker sleeping. So they were running both after uh, for the World War One and World War Two production, three shifts continually. So then you'd get off of a third shift right. and you'd want to go like you would on first shift, go and have a couple of brews, brewskis. So our bars were open early the time, in the morning. Yeah. Tractor Inn was a, a popular bar. Yeah. And, um, and then they had sleeping rooms. Uh, there wasn't enough um, housing to house 46,000 workers. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'd have sleeping rooms above the bars. And so West Dallas was known for having a bar and then up above having uh, sleeping rooms uh, with a common bathroom and kitchen and that. So now they still have those, like when you go down Greenfield Avenue, there's people that live upstairs. There's a couple places so. still left and um, uh, big on rooming houses, as mm -hmm. they call it, mm -hmm. uh, where you could have more than one family living in, in, in a house. And that was grandfathered in, you know, over the years. There aren't that many of them left, mm -hmm. but if you remember, there were even... Um, like the governor was right. one of them. Is that still there? I don't That's still there. still there. Yeah. yeah, and that was, but now it's opened up to both sexes. When we were working, right. it was for men only. There was know. that one, and there was one on 81st Street yep. too. Right yeah, a lot of uh, uh, places. Uh, and what would happen during the war when when uh, production uh, ramped up and they had to have more employees, you would get out of your bed and someone would jump into it yeah. from another shift. You know, so even. sharing whatever's yeah. available. Right? Whatever is okay. available, yeah, to okay. get the job done. Okay. And uh, the governor's still there, so that's still, is that still considered a rooming house where people, are those I rented by the month or how is that? Good question. I don't know. I don't that know. That uh, it's been a while since I've been yeah, involved yeah, in that, but yeah. they were weekly. Uh, they did when have I was weekly. Working, they were, okay. Yeah, they okay. were weekly rooms. Yeah, because yeah, I've been there and I've been to the other one a few times. So Kind of like parking uh, during the fair on the front lawns. It's, yeah. it's one of those things that it's kind of colloquial, but uh, we know about it, but a lot of other people in the area might not know about that you know do you know when that started how long ago because as far as i know remember that people have been doing that we've got articles going way back into the 60s and 50s how they were allowed to park and they would make enough mm -hmm. money to pay their taxes mm -hmm. uh these people um i got a funny story about that my yeah. first day on the job um i hadn't gone to recruit school yet or anything i got hired at the end of july and of course, state fair starts August. Right. So they put me in a uniform and gave me a and station go gun, way. and they they <laughs> gave me a whistle and said, "Remember, it's one long one to stop, and two short ones to go." And they put me on 84th and Mitchell, okay. and I'm supposed to swing traffic there. It's gotten better since then. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget this story. Is I grew up in West Dallas. I knew all about parking up all your lawn, your front lawn, your back lawn, your side lawn. Every, if you could get it on the front porch, <laughs> you know. And um, so I had this. Uh, I'm on the corner there, just trying, going to try out my whistle. Yeah. And uh, this lady runs up to me and says, "Officer, officer." I says, "What?" She says, "Well, look, look, my front lawn." And I says, "Yeah." your front lawn well it's all full of cars i says the whole block's full of cars you know well i went to the grocery store this morning and there was nothing on my front lawn and um, i says well i don't know what to do mm -hmm. what to tell you you know um all of a sudden a man was running back and walks up onto her front lawn to get his binoculars out of the car mm -hmm. and i says sir what are you doing why are you parked on this lady's front lawn? He says, what are you talking about? I paid $5 to the little boy I with the flag. <laughs> so we even had entrepreneurs back hey, in yeah. the day, if they saw an elderly couple leave, they parked <laughs> up their front lawn. <laughs> Taking advantage of opportunities. Opportunity knocks, right. Okay. Yeah. 
Great, because so that goes back that far. Yeah, that was, was in the seventies sure. when I started, okay. and uh, it's and you in, found stuff back to the fifties. Yes, parking we've, on the we've got. Yeah, they've been doing it, so it, that's one of those grandfathered things. Yeah. At one time, they were going to talk about uh, charging sales tax, and there's a big article in our local West Dallas Star, right. and, and they were adamant that that's a cash deal, and there should be no tax, and the states stay out of it. And, right. You know, right. That there's always yeah. Thing. There's always some right argument about something right so okay well great well i think we i'm going to open it up to we're coming toward our time i think so sure because you, you have another engagement too right? i do so busy you, busy because you're you're retired but not you're running around more i think now than i am i'm was, probably working harder <laughs> now than i did for you yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> me too but we won't get into that but uh, <laughs> So I'm going to open it up to anything that you'd like to share that we didn't talk about because we just scratched the surface on historical society and all your knowledge and everything. So I really appreciate you coming and sharing that with us. It was great. Uh, but anything that you would that we didn't talk about that you'd like to share uh, before we conclude? Can, can you start with what I'm dying to know the meaning of the West Dallas landmark sign that we stuck up here? Oh, the landmark sign. Well, this happens to be coming out. We talked a little bit about that uh, Frank Seneca Wadham station on 76th. And I this morning before I came here, I opened up the building and took this out. This is a a local history landmark plaque that uh, if you are in the area, have a home or a business in the area and think it has some kind of historic value, um, you can apply through our development and engineering department at the city for a local history landmark. And it um, is much less, or it's much easier and much less restrictive than the national or state is. So you could actually apply and get one of these plaques um, if you have um, what you believe is a historic home. We have a lot of people, I said our housing stock is over 100 years old, people are there living there or purchased the place and said, I wonder who lived there before me. Well, they come down to our museum, go into our research library where we have all the city directories. You don't know, maybe a, a old mover and shaker of the city or the county area lived in that same house. And uh, it's kind of like uh, on the East Coast and you think uh, you, you go down and said George Washington slept here mm-hmm, or something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. But it's similar to that type of situation. So we open that up um, for anybody in the area that is interested um, in doing research, like I call it genealogy on your property, you know, who was there before you type thing. So uh, this happened to uh, come out of that. But uh, wrapping this up, I would uh, Mm -hmm. like to really push uh, interest in local history. The state used to make the fourth graders um, throughout the whole state learn a little bit about local history that has long passed, but um, we put up that log cabin in, on our site there just for that, and we offer tours to fourth graders where they're actually taught just like they would have been taught when Wisconsin became the 30th state of the Union in 1848. Uh, that cabin was actually, dates from the 1840s, was found in Sheboygan County, and we went up to Sheboygan County, took that log cabin apart log by log, transported it down here to West Dallas, and reassembled it. Um, and um, we are open for school tours, business tours. I've actually had um, people say they want their prom um, photos taken in the cabin. Yeah, I've had a wedding in the cabin already. Uh, I can see that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, we really, really encourage people to come out and celebrate our heritage and our history. Uh, we did run something called Settlers Weekend for 13 years, and uh, we're hoping now that COVID's uh, maybe in the in the rearview mirror that we might bring that back. Maybe not every year like we had it running, but maybe you know every five years or something, and bring reenactors in and tradesmen and craftsmen and that mm-hmm. in. I did want to plug a couple of things. We have an open house this Sunday uh, from one to three, um, and also um, the downtown West Dallas Inc. and the Business Improvement District is hosting in January Winter Week in West Dallas. And it's a wonderful week. We go throughout the whole city. Uh, We're going to start at the museum on that Sunday. I think it's the 14th of January with a scavenger hunt and that with prizes. And then I have an old sleigh that you could bring your whole family. And I have, I go up in the attic and get costumes from the 1800s. You put on old beaver coats and hats and muffs and you get in this and you pull up this horsehair uh, blanket over you and 
you hand us your camera we, uh, or phone and we take a picture of you and you can use it for next year's Christmas card. Mm -hmm. So pray for snow pray. for January for <laughs> yeah. 14th there. Um, and then part of that uh, downtown thing is a soup crawl on that Wednesday of that week. And that's a wonderful, you go to 12 different places where you get a, a sample of uh, homemade soup by the places and it ends up with ice skating uh, down in our uh, Liberty Hearts Park and the library has uh, a day that they have an event and I believe the Senior Center does too. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know, uh, please take advantage of these opportunities to celebrate uh, history. What's the address for the Historical Society and your website where they can where I presume some of this information is posted. Yeah, our webpage is westallishistory.org. So it's all one word, westallishistory.org. Our address is 8405 West National Avenue. We do have a, a, a landline phone there, 414-541-6970. However, we're only there a uh, limited number of hours a week, so I always encourage anyone to call my cell phone which is 414-801-6886. If you have any questions about uh, a group tour or uh, coming down, uh, visiting, we accept lots of people who want to volunteer down there. We encourage people to just come and hang out on a Tuesday night or a Sunday afternoon and see what it's all about. And you have videos on YouTube as well? That, I do. Uh, the city uh, had done for The you? city has them. If you type my name in exactly how it's spelled, into uh, YouTube search, you'll come up with three videos and soon to be a fourth one, the Days of the Doughboys is being made as we speak and it's gonna be uh, uh, uploaded to YouTube. Or you can access it through the city webpage under the departments of uh, development, engineering development, and then under historic preservation. Uh, the videos are there too. Okay. We didn't talk about this. And I saw this and it reminds me of an old pot box that you might have had from the <laughs> drug days. Not your drug, doing drug, the working in the drug unit days. So I was wondering why you brought your pot box with you today. So well, again, we didn't it, talk about that though. Yeah, it's one of the uh, <laughs> items that I bring on my, my little tabletop museum. This uh, particular box is probably 150, maybe 175 years old, and it contains dominoes. Uh, real popular game now yeah. but if you look at the dominoes they're made out of real ebony wood and real ivory with a little nail in the center of them yeah. it's just one of the many artifacts that we have um, including two original Monopoly games from wow. 1936 when really? when it was actually invented by the Parker Brothers so um, be, our museum has tons of artifacts from all walks of life um, it could be a doll collection that someone, uh, or toy collection. We have a church uh, a collection of artifacts, uh, military artifacts. Uh, we just had a 15-year-old boy work on one of the um, bombers from World War II. He, he was from West Dallas, grew up in West Dallas, got drafted, became a B-17 bomber, and had 19 successful missions over Germany and that never told his family. Kept everything in his footlocker. Footlocker gets donated to the Historical Society, and I have a 15-year-old boy that's interested in military history. He created a beautiful um, exhibit uh, out of everything in that uh, box. We're constantly changing and rotating our exhibits so that you can come down. Uh, one thing, I was just last Saturday up in Madison getting some information on a piece of float copper that was just donated. It's 40 pounds. It looks like a little mm -hmm. rock. It's 40 pounds, and it's ab absolute um, uh, copper that was came down in the glaciation period of Wisconsin, left on someone's farm in Orchard Hills, mm. oh, no. Rust Court. Okay. And as the farmer, 150, 175 years ago, was plowing it with his horse, it broke his plow mm -hmm. as he hit it. And so he... The long story is the, the family that owned the farm at the time dragged it um, eventually to Iowa, and he's 95 years old. He called me and said, you know, that should really belongs back in West Dallas where it came from, and he donated it to the museum. Oh, so nice. we're getting lots of artifacts, you know, yeah. and uh, of course that's on display right away, so come on down. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Well, thank you very much. I think we're... 
going to take a little break. And I really appreciate you coming. It was very nice seeing okay. you again. It's been yeah. a little while. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I think we just scratched the surface on the historical society with uh, the time we had. Uh, so if you uh, have any time or make time, go down and visit the uh, historical society and talk to Devin. He'll be happy to show you around, right? You're right. Guided private, tours, private. private tour or, or self-tour, whatever you, you want to do. So, excellent. Very nice. So Thanks, Chuck. We'll be back here at Michael's uh, for Hello County, 8417 West Cleveland. We'll be back in a few minutes.